Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 752 for January 27th, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. We went round in circles uh, looking for solutions. And ultimately, you know, it like the, the best for both was, you know, to demerge, to split, to um, uh, divide the business. Back in early December, I talked about the state of Irish whiskey with Walsh Whiskey Company founder Bernard Walsh. But it turns out there was a story developing behind the scenes at the time. Five years ago, Walsh Whiskey entered into a joint venture with Italy's Ilva Serrano Holdings. And that helped fund construction of the Walsh Whiskey Distillery in Ireland's County Carlo. Friday, the two partners announced their plans to break up the joint venture. Walsh will keep the brands it brought to the marriage, the Irishman and Writer's Tears, while Ilva Serrano gets custody of the distillery and all of the whiskey that's been laid down over the last couple of years. I'll talk with Bernard Walsh about the split on Whiskey Cast in depth. That's coming up later, along with the calendar of events, the What I'm Tasting This Week department, and on Behind the Label, we'll look at the celebration of Scotland's bard, the great Robert Burns. It's all just ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. It's back to work Monday for the U.S. federal government workers who have been furloughed since the partial government shutdown began on December 22nd. That includes the Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau staff, which will have a big backlog of applications for label approvals to process. Online applications have been coming in throughout the shutdown, And while we don't have the numbers yet on how many applications are in the pipeline, the TTB's website shows the average expected processing time for labels on whiskeys, other spirits, and wines now stands at 36 days, while beers and other malt beverages are listed at 41 days. As we've reported over the last few weeks, U.S. distilleries cannot release new whiskeys, without a certificate of label approval, and importers can't get their whiskeys through U.S. Customs without those certificates either. It should be noted that the deal between Congress and the Trump administration to end the shutdown only covers the next three weeks, and there's no guarantee that a long-term compromise will be reached by then. We'll keep you posted. We've had a couple of stories during the last month about whiskeys that were affected by the TTB shutdown, but here's one that was not. Daniel Zor of England's Cotswolds Distillery barely made it in time. His importer received the label approval for the new cask strength Cotswolds Founder's Choice just two days before the shutdown began. I caught up with him the other day at the Victoria Whiskey Festival. Founder's Choice is 100% STR, shaved, toasted, and recharred wine cask. Uh, This was Jim Swan's uh, great invention, and it goes really well with our spirit. Uh, Just it's a real fruit bomb, a lot of complexity, a lot of intensity. uh, and It's my favorite, hence the name. Cotswold's Founder's Choice is already available in the UK and Europe, along with Alberta, and will be in the U.S. and in British Columbia private stores soon, along with other key markets. 
A couple of other new whiskeys to mention. Sweden's MacMira Distillery has released its latest Moment Limited Edition, Moment Caribbean, and that's spelled K-A-R-I-B-I-E-N, and it uses, as you might guess, Caribbean rum casks. It's part of a barrel swap with plantation rum from Maison Ferrand and uses casks from Barbados and Jamaica. Around 4,100 bottles will be available in Europe for around 110 pounds each. That's around $145 at current exchange rates. And Brown Foreman has added a new barrel reserve addition to its Cooper's Choice bourbon lineup. It's bottled at 50% ABV, compared to the original Cooper's Choice at 41.1%. And the new version is matured in so-called chiseled and charred barrels, made at Brown Foreman's own cooperage in Louisville. It'll sell for around $30 a bottle. I'll have tasting notes for it soon at whiskeycast.com. In other news, we broke the news on WhiskeyCast during the holidays that Michter's would be opening its new Fort Nelson Micro Distillery and Visitor's Center on Louisville's Whiskey Row at the end of this month. After about six years of construction work, Michter's has now officially confirmed that the grand opening is set for this coming Thursday, January 31st, with public tours to begin on Saturday, February 2nd. In addition to tours and a gift shop, the Fort Nelson Distillery will also have a bar with cocktails curated by longtime drinks writer and historian David Wondrich. Also on the Kentucky tourism front, Buffalo Trace released its 2018 Visitors Center data this week. More than 231,000 people visited the distillery in Frankfurt last year. That's up 15% from 2017. And it's an indicator of what we should see when the Kentucky Distillers Association releases its 2018 report for the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Buffalo Trace is not a member of the KDA and is not part of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. But previous years have shown that its tourism growth tracks fairly closely to that for the distilleries that are on the Bourbon Trail. Meanwhile, Buffalo Trace is planning to start construction on a second expansion of its visitor's center later this year. That follows an expansion back in 2015, and it'll be done alongside a major expansion of the distillery with new mash cookers and 12 additional fermenters. Buffalo Trace has also revived one old fermenter, the 1883 vintage one that was uncovered during construction on the original distillery building back in 2016. Workers rebuilt the brick walls of the fermenter and relined it with copper. It'll be used to ferment Colonel E.H. Taylor's old-fashioned sour mash to be distilled in the micro-still at Buffalo Trace. Whistlepig Rye has a new partner, BDT Capital Partners has taken a minority stake in the Vermont distillery for an undisclosed amount. According to a company statement, the deal allowed some of Whistlepig's longtime shareholders a chance to cash out. That includes Whistlepig co-founder Raj Peter Bakta. He left the management team at Whistlepig in 2017 following a court fight with other directors and sold his remaining shares in the distillery as part of the deal. Last time around, we heard from the owners of Fett's Whiskey Kitchen in Vancouver. Allura and Eric Fergie are facing an enforcement hearing in May following the seizure by British Columbia liquor inspectors of 242 bottles of Scotch Malt Whiskey Society whiskeys from Fett's a year ago. Last week, Canada's Competition Bureau called on British Columbia officials to change the regulation the Fergies are accused of violating. They bought those society bottlings from one of the province's privately owned liquor stores instead of the government-owned stores as required. If those government-owned stores decide to not stock a specific whiskey, it's illegal for bars and restaurants to source that whiskey from private stores. The Competition Bureau called that restriction anti-competitive and anti-consumer. After our episode last week, a spokesman for B.C. Attorney General David Eby emailed this response 
from the Attorney General to the Competition Bureau in Ottawa. And I'm quoting now, I appreciate that the Federal Competition Bureau is interested in our work to modernize and improve our liquor policy and how it deals with hospitality in particular. I'm a little surprised that they are so interested, as British Columbia is not the only province that operates the way we do, but I'm glad for the letter and will certainly take it into consideration as we go forward with the review process. Last June, a panel tasked with recommending changes to British Columbia liquor policies submitted its report calling for a change in that ban on private retailers selling to so-called hospitality licensees, basically bars and restaurants. No timetable has been set for action on those recommendations. One whiskey produced in British Columbia made headlines last week during the Canadian Whiskey Awards. Bareface Canadian Whiskey from Mark Anthony Wines and Spirits took the award for Best New Canadian Whiskey of the Year. It's made with sourced whiskeys using a blending process developed over the last two years by whiskey maker Andres Faustinelli. We took a completely different approach on whiskey, so we brought the whiskey inside the winery and started uh, bringing whiskey with the mindset of a winemaker. And the whole process was, since Canada is amazing because the regulations are really open for innovation versus other uh, bourbons and scotch, uh, we really nailed it completely in the opposite way. We took like the whiskey age seven years and we took it into wine cask and then we started uh, using Hungarian oak to give a final structure to the whiskey like thinking about wine. So it was really a process, took us really two years of research and it was done inside me going uh, to Kelowna and working monthly basis uh, and testing where we were going and what came out was a uh, whiskey that we were not expecting, we were not planning, but came something completely different and not from a book, but from simply experimentation. And uh, at the end of the day, rea realistically speaking, we're creating a, a whiskey that is uh, as an entry that is welcoming, uh, you taste it, but has a finish that has a structure. There is tannins, there is oak, but it's not a green oak like bourbons because we use high quality Hungarian oak uh, that is usually used for winemaking. Where do you go from here now? Because uh, this is going to be a tough act to follow. I want to keep focusing on innovation and uh, every year we're going to be releasing innovation. And I think uh, the brand, uh, the brand heart, at the, at the core of the brand is uh, showcasing what Canadian whiskey can be and what we can showcase to the world about whiskey. I think we are the most uh, innovation-driven regulation in the world, and there is a massive opportunity. As of now, Bareface is only available in Canada, but you'll find my tasting notes for it at whiskeycast.com. Japan's shortage of domestic whiskeys is getting worse. JustDrinks.com reported this week that Suntory Spirits has stopped production on most sizes of its Shirokaku blended whiskey, along with smaller bottlings of its Kakubin blend and the Cheetah single grain whiskey. The report quotes a Suntory spokesperson as saying the move was needed to make more whiskey available for the core 700 ml bottlings of Kakubin and Cheetah. Suntory has been investing heavily in distilling capacity over the last 10 years, but stocks of mature whiskey are still in short supply. And finally, congratulations to the winner of last Saturday's inaugural Big Blind Bourbon Taste Off in Lexington, Kentucky. Brock Robert Tagarook broke a seven way tie after the first round by nailing the second sample in the final. He not only got the tasting notes for that sample, but correctly guessed the distillery, brand, expression, and even the batch number. It was Heaven Hill's Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, batch B517. Brock Robert won $2,000 in cash, a bourbon barrel head trophy, and the biggest prize of all, 
bragging rights. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. I'm back on the road once again this week after spending last week in Victoria, and it always pays to take a look at the duty-free shop when you're traveling. That's where you'll find the new range of travel retail exclusives from Highland Park, including the special travel edition of Highland Park's legendary 18-year-old Viking Pride. It's bottled at 46% ABV, compared to the standard version at 43%, and that one has been considered one of the world's best whiskeys for many, many years. Check out the entire lineup at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. Bottle Rocket Wine and Spirit in New York City is kicking off its annual Free Mondo Whiskey Tasting Series with a different event each night during February. It starts this Friday night on the 1st with a Dave Pickerel Tribute Tasting featuring Whistle Pig, Hill Rock Estate, and Blackened American Whiskies. The Kensington Wine Market in Calgary, Alberta has a tasting of Cadenhead's Whiskies coming up on the 7th. Westport Whiskey and Wine in Louisville has Bourbon and Bean Family Trivia Night with Fred No that same night. Balconis Distilling and Milo All Day have their I Can't Drink You Away Valentine's Dinner coming up on the 12th in Waco, Texas. Distill America is on the 16th in Madison, Wisconsin. The Whiskey Exchange hosts a Michter's tasting at its Fitzrovia store in London on the 18th. And a few tickets are still available for the Whiskey Show Old and Rare, coming up February 23rd and 24th in Glasgow, Scotland. Whiskey and Barrel Night New York is on the 27th. And Whiskey Magazine has now announced the dates later this year for its new Whiskey Live events in New York and Chicago. Whiskey Live New York will be on May 22nd. Whiskey Live Chicago is on November 7th. There's no word yet on whether Whiskey Live will return to Washington, D.C., as we first reported last month. We'll keep you posted. Right now, there are 213 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. Just click on the search button to find events near you or wherever you'll be traveling during 2019. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Lestow. Carrying Redbreast trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Lestow edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Friday, we got word of the divorce between Ireland's Walsh Whiskey Company and its Italian partner, Ilva Serrano Holdings. Five years ago, the two companies joined forces, with Serrano putting up most of the money to build Walsh Whiskey's distillery at Royal Oak in County Carlo. The divorce agreement calls for Serrano to keep the distillery, which is being renamed the Royal Oak Distillery. Walsh will keep the Writer's Tears and the Irishman whiskey brands that it brought to the table, and no jobs will be lost. Production and visitors center workers will stay with Serrano, while the sales and marketing team will remain with Walsh Whiskey. Like many marriages, things did not go as smoothly as hoped behind the scenes, though it appeared successful from the outside. Sales of Walsh's Writer's Tears and the Irishman brands have expanded globally, especially after Serrano's U.S. unit took over as the importer for those brands in Irish whiskey's largest global market and put its marketing muscle behind them in the U.S. Full disclosure, the Writer's Tears brand is a sponsor of Whiskey Cast, and we have worked with both the Serrano team in the U.S. and Walsh's team in Ireland as part of that sponsorship. 
Ilva Serrano executives were not available for interviews after the announcement, but company spokesman Stefano Battioni told us this in an email. Ilva's objective is to further enhance Royal Oak as a center of excellence in Irish whiskey making by continuously improving its technology and processes, producing all three styles, malt, pot, and grain under one roof, enhancing the visitor experience, and achieving recognition as one of the best quality Irish whiskey producers in the market. Regarding the commercial side, Ilva Serrano never reveals ahead of time its plans for the future. In any given moment, we study developments for our spirits business based on our global vocation. We always look at the way to exploit the best opportunity offered by the global market environments that is our natural habitat, and by our strong distribution network that covers 160 countries, making international markets responsible for more than 90% of our turnover. Once again, that's from Ilva Serrano spokesman Stefano Battioni. I spoke with Walsh Whiskey founder Bernard Walsh after the announcement Friday, and he shed a bit more light on what prompted the split. Unfortunately, I suppose not all marriages and partnerships work out, um, and uh, that's what happened in this case. You know, we had, um, I suppose, different views on where the company should go, the vision for the future. You know, it's it's very important to me. We 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 focus on on premium, super premium whiskies, and you know, we just, uh, I suppose, that our vision and that vision of our Italian partners were just not shared, and. Um, we went round in circles uh, looking for solutions and ultimately you know it like the, the best for both was you know to demerge to split to um, uh, divide the business and uh, uh, without risking anything in terms of employment and jobs so all safe and instead of having one whiskey company in Carlo we now have two and um, you know I'm just so delighted, I suppose, that we have our babies back, uh, the Irishman and Writer's Tears, uh, Walsh Whiskey, all within the, you know, 100% control of the of the Irish now. And that's the key thing here is that uh, in a lot of situations where we've seen uh, whiskey companies that take on larger partners, the original founder winds up, for lack of a better term, getting screwed when these things break up. In this case, you're not. You're walking away with everything you had before. Yeah, and uh, we're we're walking away with everything we had before. Plus, we've grown the, we've grown that business threefold. So we're, if you like, inheriting a, a business which is three times bigger. And I am very confident that we will double the size of that business in the next three years. So, you know, I suppose somehow I suppose we I, I feel you know we're, we're 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 lucky and we're we've come out on the right side of this. This almost was a good time for this to happen because as of yet, you were still not relying on the distillery for any of the whiskey that goes into your products. Your stuff was all still aging that was being made at Royal Oak, so it doesn't affect your current supply situation. Very true. Um, you know, uh, 100% of the supply for Writer's Tears and the Irishman um, is is not is not out of uh, is not coming from Royal Oak, but it's coming from uh, our contracts with Irish distillers. And you know, we've always maintained. And if you go back on your your tapes over the years and uh, records, we've always maintained keeping that because we never believed in. Well, we'll 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 just get new distillers and. Over time, we'll morph that into Riders Tears and the Irishman. We said, no, we've got to be true uh, to Riders Tears and the Irishman. You know, the consumer knows what it knows the taste of those those, uh, those brands, and we stand fully full square behind it. And um, we are not going to mess around with that taste. And what we w- were planning, I suppose, out of Royal Oak were, were new expressions. So we're, you know, we I suppose now we look back and say, well, what does it look? But no, we we were 100% saying that. Uh, the expressions of Riders Tears and the Irishman that are in the market today, uh, we would not change those recipes. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we are blessed with good whiskey supplies. Will you try to build another distillery? <laughs> uh, I would love to. Uh, maybe not today. I need to dust myself down. We've, uh, we're just uh, fully re-energized on the 
um, on, on uh, Rogers Tears and, and the Irishman, and, and get you know we're in 40 markets at the moment worldwide, including the US, where we actually uh, doubled our, our sales and, and depletions last year. So we're really looking to ramp those up, and that's going to take up a lot of my energy. Uh, however, you know, um, I would. I would really, I, I've learned a lot uh, in the last 20 years and learned a lot in building our distillery and uh, I see opportunities for us uh, once uh, I suppose the dust settles in getting back into distilling. You sound positive, but this cannot have been easy for you because I know how much you've put into building that distillery and what you were planning to do to restore the old estate next door. I can imagine that this still has to be somewhat bittersweet for you and Rosemary. Yeah, you, you've uh, you've hit the nail on the head there. You know, for for me and Rosemary, we've um, you know we plowed every furrow, we 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 picked every tile, we we oversaw every a pound of concrete that was poured into uh, the distillery, every every piece of wrought iron that went for supports. Uh, you know, we were there right the way through, and you know, even the the whole design and uh, you know it was something that we absolutely loved doing. And for us, I suppose we created that chapter of history, uh, that chapter of Irish whiskey distilling in Carlow and in the southeast of Ireland, which had been absent for, for 200 years. So um, we are so proud of what we've created. And we, you know, now I suppose it's it's uh, up to our Italian friends to write the next chapter um, while, you know, we 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 hate leaving our baby behind. Um, it's it's down to them to write the next chapter. We're very proud of what we've done there, and we're really positive about our brands, Riders Tears and the Irishman. Really positive about where we can bring them. We're in over uh, 50 countries at the moment worldwide, and uh, looking to uh, grow beyond that. What happens to the employees now? Um, I know you told them before we talked, and I can imagine that uh, this had to have come as a bit of a shock to the staff. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's um, uh, if, of course it is it's it's news for them, and uh, but w- again, we, you know, we are uh, lucky to have a great team both at the distillery. So we have two locations. We always had two locations. So one was the distillery, and the other, um, the offices uh, in Carlo. So um, it uh, you know, we're blessed with just great staff and. Uh, Yesterday afternoon, I went round to meet uh, all the distillers and, uh, you know, just ch- chat through and, um, you know, they're, they're hugely supportive and I was encouraging them to, to push on and, and do great things at uh, Royal Oak. And then our staff here um, at Equity House in Carlo, where sales and marketing and administration, you know, just great people that have been with me for years. You know, Geraldine has been with us almost since uh, we started 20 years ago. So just super people. And it's because of them, you know, we are successful. Um, so they're, they're full square behind us. Who stays with you? Who stays with the distillery? Um, at the distillery, so all the uh, uh, production uh, people, uh, so the distillers, stay at the distillery. Uh, so there's no movement of staff there. And uh, at Equity House, where we have our uh, offices, uh, everybody there stays with what we call the trading business. So it's the brands, Riders Tears, and the Irishman. So our sales and marketing administration. So there was, um, again, it, maybe it's a, a, a twist of fate, but uh, when we went into the venture with uh, our Italian friends uh, five years ago, we actually kept separate the sales marketing administration the branded business we just that was run out of our carlo offices and the distillery focused uh, on obviously dist- the distillation what about the tourism staff the visitor center folks and the tour guides and uh, the shop folks yep all 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 all, all staying put at the distillery and uh, you you'll, you'll know woody and he's you know one of our great friends and uh, uh, so woody will uh, Turn up on Monday as normal, and uh, visitors uh, are all welcome. What do you think it's going to be like the next time you drive by there, or the first time you drive by there, after they change the sign? And it's no longer the Walsh Whiskey Distillery, it's Royal Oak Distillery. Yeah, no, a, a very good question. Um, you know, I'm just, I suppose, well, for you know, for I, I know that... Myself and Rosemary and the team uh, have created um, and written the first chapters 
of distilling in our region in over 200 years. That can't be taken away and won't be taken away. That's that's in stone down there. So, you know, we're so proud of that. So, um, you know, names uh, will, will come and go, but the history is there. So, you know, we've we've written those early chapters and, uh, I'm, you know, who knows, maybe we've got a few more chapters to write. Are there any lessons out of this that uh, other folks within the industry can learn? I'm I'm sure I'm sure there are, but I've just if you like we've just come through this, and I probably need a couple of days to dust myself down and then just uh, reflect. So maybe maybe when I write my memoirs, I'll be able to share those. But um, you know, I, we probably need a couple of days just to to reflect on that. Okay, I think that about does it. Um, when are you going to release the uh, cognac cask? Ah, <laughs> that's a cracker, and I've been waiting to do my tasting notes for it. But uh, I just uh, Connor said probably now, sometime next month. Yes, uh, we're going to release it in February, and um, our yourself, Mark, and uh, uh, our, cons- our, our you know consumers in in the U.S. are going to be first to get their hands on it. So the Kanye, it's 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 amazing. I, even if I do so myself, say myself, but. Uh, you know, we're you know we're really focusing on super premium Irish whiskey. This plays right into that space. Um, you you know, Mark, that uh, the category of Irish whiskey is growing, say, at ten percent per annum um, over the last number of years. Well, super premium Irish whiskey for Irish is growing at eighteen, and we have no no doubt that the uh, you know the Irish super premium category is totally underrepresented. So what we're doing with the Conya cask and some new product development that we have in the pipeline for the coming 12 months is re- is all aimed at, you know, really trying to right the wrongs there that, you know, Irish um, have a lot to contribute in the super premium. And in the next couple of weeks, uh, I look forward to you being able to announce uh, the arrival of the Konya cask finish um, and uh, look forward to getting your, your, your tasting notes on it. And one other quick note about the transfer. Um, with the distillery went all the whiskey that you guys had been making for the last three years, right? Correct, yeah. So they're keeping all that stock for them. Yes. And they're also, but you're still going to work with De Serrano to a certain extent because uh, they are your U.S. importer, and I believe in three other countries, right? Yeah, correct. So um, all the commercial contracts stay in place or partnerships on distribution. You know, we work very, very well with them in the markets and um, we look forward to sort of growing those. So uh, be it U.S. and Holland uh, in particular, where we have uh, very strong partnerships. So that's working well. And um, we have, let's say, separate contracts governing those. For, the, for now, that could always change, but that can change with any importer. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, we we and uh, you know, we we are lucky. We have some super uh, partners that we've been working with for years. So you know, we try not to change. It's it's never ideal. So it it is a relationship, and um, you know, we're looking forward to building that with our current partners. So far, we've heard from one person directly affected by the split. Woody Kane was a brand ambassador for the Walsh Brands but his main focus was on the visitor's center at the distillery, and he will be staying there under Ilva Serrano management. He sent this tweet earlier in the weekend. The whiskey industry is in a very exciting time, as you know, and we want to continue to give that mark of excellence that we offer in our visitor experience as we move forward and focus on quality with all we do in Royal Oak. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla Single Malt. Look for the new House Lannister Lagavulin 9 year old. It's part of the Game of Thrones Single Malt Scotch Whiskey Collection from Diageo and HBO. Look for it at a whiskey shop near you and check out the rest of the Lagavulin Single Malts at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start with the Glenrothes Whiskey Maker's Cut. It's the one no-age statement bottling in the new Solio collection from the Glenrothes, and it's matured in first-fill sherry-seasoned casks. It's bottled at 48.6% ABV, 
The nose has notes of toffee, orange marmalade, and vanilla. The taste has a good balance of baking spices, vanilla, honey, and orange marmalade, and the finish is long with lingering spices, orange peel, and just a hint of vanilla. That extra bottling strength gives it a nice boost, and I'm scoring the Glenrothes Whiskey Maker's Cut a 93. Aaron recently launched its 21-year-old single malt, and I received a sample the other day. It's bottled at 46% ABV. The nose has notes of cherry cobbler, caramel, vanilla, toffee, muted spices, and just a hint of oak. The taste, thick and fruity with apricots, peaches, white pepper, allspice, and hints of toffee and vanilla in the background. The finish has a slight fruity tartness and spices that fade away gently. I'm scoring the Aaron 21-year-old a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. 85 years ago, as the end of Prohibition meant a renewed demand for Kentucky bourbon, Ed Shapira and his brothers invested in a new distillery in Bardstown. They bought their partners out later on. Today, that little startup is the largest family-owned and operated distillery. Get the entire history at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. The Whiskey Exchange has released several interesting bottlings in conjunction with the Whiskey Agency in Germany, including the Speyside Region 1973 blended malt. This one comes from various Speyside malts that were blended and left to rest in a butt for a few years. It was bottled in 2017 at 47.4% ABV, and I received a sample the other day. The nose is fruity and sweet with a subtle touch of citrus, dried apple chips, brown sugar, and subtle touches of spices and oak. The taste starts off creamy and smooth with a great buildup of spicy cilantro and other herbs, along with dried fruits that create an excellent balance and complexity. Hints of shortbread cookies, vanilla scones, and just a touch of spearmint come alive in the background leading up to the finish. That finish is long with gentle and subtle hints of dried fruits, spearmint, soft spices, and dried flowers. This one is an outstanding whiskey. I'm scoring the Whiskey Agency Speyside Region 1973 Blended Malt a 95. And finally, let's look at the Old Forester 100 Proof Rye I mentioned in the news last time around. There was a sample waiting for me when I got home this week from Victoria. Of course, it's bottled at 50% ABV, the nose is spicy and aromatic with baking spices, caramel, vanilla, and just a hint of honey. The taste is spicy with intense clove, cinnamon, allspice, and a hint of ginger that last and last, then start to fade slowly to reveal touches of vanilla and caramel throughout the finish. I'm scoring the Old Forester 100 Proof Rye a 91. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,400 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. A quick program note, we have a brand new episode of Whiskey Cast HD available to watch now online. Forty Creek Distillery founder John Hall turned up in Victoria last week 
for the first time since he sold the distillery to Campari five years ago. He was the keynote speaker at the Canadian Whiskey Awards dinner during the festival, and I sat down with him for an exclusive interview. You can watch it now on YouTube and at whiskeycast.com, or you can download it on iTunes. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. It's presented by Lot 40. We've already had a couple of comments on that interview with John Hall. Ajay Bardwaj of Grimsby, Ontario, posted this on our Facebook page. I wonder, all those times I passed Kittling Ridge on the QEW as a kid, from Winona to Beamsville and back for hockey. Maybe my passion for whiskey was influenced sooner than I first thought. John, I live in Grimsby. Never too old to be an apprentice if you're looking for one. Cheers. And I should explain that John did confirm in our interview that his non-compete agreement with Campari does end later this year, but he still hasn't decided what his next venture will be, or even if it'll be in the whiskey business at all. We'll keep you posted. And Sue Williams, at Real Sue Williams on Twitter, shared this, had the pleasure of sitting in the bar and John came in. He was so pleasant and had wonderful stories. One of the few sessions I was glad I did not have a ticket. And that's one of the best reasons to stay at a hotel when it's hosting a whiskey festival. You never know who might stop by the bar. I received this email from Brian Schmitz the other day. I apologize, as I used to be a regular listener, but took almost a year off and have been catching up. While listening to the recent Tax and Trade Bureau discussions, I couldn't help but get annoyed during your discussion with Richard Hobbs in episode 746. These days, especially in America, surely due to bourbon, everyone uses the term barrel for any kind of cask. Years ago, after much confusion in buying world whiskeys, I learned that a barrel is a size and not the cask itself. After all, I doubt you would ever hear the term sherry barrel in place of sherry butt or sherry cask. However, I always hear people talking about mini barrels, etc. This perhaps could be a good topic for behind the label. I don't think the problem with the new laws is in the definition of barrel, but rather the problem is in requiring barrels to be used for all whiskeys. Perhaps they can use that for the new law of bourbon but not everything. Please let me know what you think. Sorry for such a long comment, and thank you for all the great work you do for whiskey lovers around the world. I'll be sure to be a regular listener once again. Cheers! Brian, thank you for your note, and Brian also included an entire list of all the various names of casks and their respective sizes, but I didn't want to share that with you this time around. Perhaps we will actually do that on an upcoming Behind the Label. But the official term for bourbon barrels is American Standard Barrel. And I try to use the term barrel in reference to bourbon barrels and cask in reference to sherry and other types of casks. But in some ways, it's like that old line, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. All barrels are casks, but not all casks are barrels. And Bryant's also referring to the proposal the TTB floated before the holidays to change the federal regulations for whiskey maturation to create the first official definition for a barrel, a cylindrical oak container of approximately 50 gallons, along with asking for comments on whether other sizes of barrels should be allowed for maturing whiskey. Here I believe it's appropriate to paraphrase Richard Hobbs of the Barrel Mills response from that interview in episode 746. Hell yes, they should. You can listen to that interview at whiskeycast.com. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers all over the world, you can always email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com, or you can track us down on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, 
Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other stuff that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. And Friday, whiskey lovers around the world celebrated Burns Night. January 25th is the birthday of one of Scotland's most celebrated poets, the legendary Robert Burns. I mentioned the Aaron 21-year-old a few minutes ago in the tasting notes, and that was my own Burns Night dram. Aaron is an official partner of the Robert Burns World Federation and bottles the closest thing to an official Robert Burns Scotch whiskey, given that no one can really claim to have exclusive rights to the Robert Burns name. I asked Aaron's David Ferguson to explain just what Robert Burns means to him and to other Scots. I think it's just, um, I'm very, a very proud Scotsman. I'm born on the 24th of January. Obviously, Robert Burns is the 25th of January, so... I personally have always been brought up with uh, Robert Burns Day being an important part um, of, of of history, um, and I say that it's, it's 260 years um, since he was born. I think it was 25th of January uh, back in 1759, and the fact that his legacy is is it lasted so long and he's um, renowned as one of the most famous Scots of all time. Um, I, I say I think you have the comparison with um, St Paddy's Day, for example, in Ireland. And I think uh, Scotland are starting to take on a more of a, a take to Robert Burns Day. Um, and uh, you know, to, uh, as a, uh, a proud Scotsman, um, Old Lang Syne is, sold, is, is sung around the world at, at Hogmanay or in, in New Year's Eve. So the fact that this tradition has um, been passed on over the generations and the, the fact that we can kind of make a, an event of it throughout the world um, is, a, is, a, is a really positive thing to promote Scotland as a, as a nation. Um, and we kind of yeah, promote ourselves around the, the Robert Burns Day. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously you've got other other famous poets that haven't haven't got a day and um, that is not celebrated to the same extent as Robert Burns. So, yeah, I'm very proud that Scotland has has Robert Burns to be able to uh, promote on a on an annual basis. I'm going to be a little tongue in cheek here because uh, we all know yep. that St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. And as a gauger, Burns would have tried to drive all the illegal whiskey out of Scotland. Correct, yes. Uh, yeah, that was his job. He was an excise man, a customs, customs officer. Um, so, yeah. Um, he, I think he actually wrote, uh, was it the Dells? It was, a, it was actually a, po- a poem he wrote about um, the devil had taken the excise man away. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. Um, but he, he did He did make a kind of tongue in cheek, yeah, just a reference to himself regarding the. The excisemen and uh, yeah, because that, that was one of the things in certainly in, in Aaron, um, in terms of Aaron, Aaron water or, or whiskey back in the day, um, it was only um, when the Aaron distillery was set up in 1995 that we actually uh, brought legal whiskey back to the island uh, for the first time in over 150 years. Um, so yeah, there's um, there's a lot of connections potentially between between Robert Burns' history as an exciseman and and the Aaron. Aaron whiskey and culture um, going back you know, 200 years. Happy birthday, David. And if you've never read any of Robert Burns' writings, we've posted a link to the Robert Burns World Foundation website in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. Pour yourself a dram and put yourself in his shoes as you read it. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, 
and links for Whiskey Cast HD and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel Podcast, brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange. Please take a minute this week and leave a review or rating for Whiskey Cast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. That'll help other whiskey lovers discover the show when they're looking for podcasts. And don't forget to share the show with your friends, too. Remember, friends help friends discover podcasts. Our Cask Strength conversation continues all week long. You'll find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. And the email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.